morning, viewers and listeners in Trinidad and Tobago and the wider world. Thank you for joining us for the Ministry of Health virtual media conference on the national COVID-19 response for Wednesday 9th, February 2022. Our panelists for this morning's update are the Honorable Terence Deyal Singh, Minister of Health, Dr. Roshan Parashram, Chief Medical Officer, and Dr. Candice Simpson-Smith, Public Health Nutritionist, Eastern Regional Health Authority. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer in the Ministry, and I will be the moderator for today's conference. We begin with Dr. Parashram, who will provide the latest clinical statistics for the parallel healthcare system. Good morning, Hi. Samuel. Good morning, Mr. Alexander. Good morning to the Honorable Minister. Good morning to Dr. Simpson-Smith. morning to members of the media and the viewing and listening public. So we begin, as usual, with the clinical update for the 8th of February 2022. If I could have the first slide. So at the top, we'll see in purple, fully vaccinated, 49.7%. The, of those, we have fully vaccinated 695,612 persons, not fully vaccinated 704, 388. Those are without a first dose or no doses. Boosters to date, 116,690. New positives over the last 24 hours, 926. And total, positive, total persons tested so far at both public and private facilities. 589,111 deaths reported over the last 24 hours 19 and condolences to the families of all of those persons. Total active positive cases so far 20,915 and those in hospital at this time that is step down as well as hospital 424. I'll break down um, those figures a little further a little later on. Patients by vaccination status again from 22nd of July 24. 21 until 19th of January 2022, fully vaccinated 2,301, not fully vaccinated 12,164. Again, the lion's share of persons who have been hospitalized during that period are not fully vaccinated, 84.1%. In terms of our deaths and related to vaccination status, as at the 3rd of February, again, 216 persons being fully vaccinated as opposed to 2,827 plus 390. So when we look a little bit further into the persons at hospital at this point, so in our facility is 340 persons in a hospital. Coover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility account for 87 persons, 15 in ICU, 5 in the High Dependency Unit, Cora Hospital 36, Augustus Long Hospital 52, St. Anne's Hospital 37, Arima General Hospital 62, New Point Fortin Hospital 28, St. James Medical Complex 21, Scarborough Regional Hospital at Fort King George 17, Scarborough General Hospital Signal Hill, none at this point in time. In our step down transition facilities, 84 persons, majority of those at the UA Debe 23 and at the Point Fortin Area Hospital 28. Other facilities have small amounts of persons at this time. So Mr. Alexander, that brings me to the end of my brief summary for this morning. Thank you very much, CMO. According to 2021 figures, non-communicable diseases accounts for deaths approximately 41 million people each year. That's equivalent to 71% of all deaths each year. More than 15 million people die from NCDs between the ages of 30 and 69, and 85% of these premature deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. Living with NCDs has made coping with COVID-19 that much harder. That's why we are happy to have Dr. Simpson-Smith with us today to share some diet and nutritional tips to assist persons living with NCDs, especially during this current pandemic. Dr. Smith, good morning. Oh, thank you. Again, good morning. Honorable Minister of Health, Mr. Dial Singh, CMO, Dr. Paris Ram, and other invited guests, members of the viewing and listening public, good morning. Non communicable diseases have long formed a part of our health landscape in Trinidad and Tobago. The available data indicates that more than half of our adult population 
has received a diagnosis of either hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, or can be classified as overweight or obese. In the two years since the COVID-19 pandemic has come to dominate our lives, the link between this infectious communicable disease and poorer outcomes for persons who have non-communicable disease has been firmly established. People with these conditions face higher rates of death as well as more serious illness when they become infected with COVID-19. Unfortunately, a large number of persons are unaware that they have a chronic disease. Too often, persons are not diagnosed until very late in the disease process as a result of some adverse event. And for too many people, this adverse event has been a COVID-19 diagnosis. Persons living with any of the, non, of the chronic non-communicable diseases are encouraged to have regular checkups with their healthcare providers to monitor the course of their disease. They should also take their medications as prescribed and monitor their condition with home equipment where possible. While some risk factors for these conditions, such as age, race, and sex, are outside of our control, we can exercise some control over our lifestyles and diet. In some persons, this alone can alleviate symptoms or even reverse the course of the disease. In my many years as a nutritional professional, I'm often asked, what is the ideal diet? This is a difficult question as ideal depends on the individual's health and other circumstances. There are very few food recommendations that can be made across the board. However, I can say with confidence that the individual who focuses on foods derived from whole foods both from plants and animals, with as little processing as possible, has the best chance of achieving health and wellness. What are whole foods? Whole foods are foods that are as close to their natural form as possible, while still being fit to eat. These foods are not necessarily raw, but they're minimally processed, if at all. They exist in their natural state. For example, a mango on its own is a whole food. Mango juice is a processed food. Chicken is a whole food, but chicken sausage is a processed food. A general rule is that in choosing whole foods, you are selecting foods that you could have grown, hunted, or fished yourself if you had the inclination to do so. No factory is needed. If a food comes in a box or a can, it's a processed food. Foods will have different degrees of processing. Some minimally processed items can be part of a nutritionally sound diet. For example, butter and cheese are made from the processing of milk. But these are minimally processed foods, and you could, perhaps with the right YouTube video, make them yourself. For convenience and availability, some persons may need to include some amount of more intensively processed foods in their diet. This, these are referred to foods that exist far from their natural state, for example, wheat flour. All is not lost. You can still make the best of the situation by limiting your food choices to foods with five ingredients or less and avoid foods with ingredients that you can't pronounce. Now for persons living with chronic diseases, close attention must be paid to food choices, even within a whole food context. For more, more recent research has indicated that many of the chronic diseases mentioned share the underlying problem of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is a well-known precursor of diabetes, but has also been implicated in the development of hypertension, heart disease, stroke, some cancers, polycystic ovaries, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and depression. Insulin is a master hormone that affects more than just your sugar levels. The steps involved in the process where increased insulin secretion leads to insulin resistance is still a matter of intense research. But we do know that there is at least one factor you can control, your diet. When we eat foods, especially starchy foods like rice and flour, or sweet foods like juices and sodas, these foods are broken down into glucose or sugars that enter our bloodstream. Our bodies function best when blood sugar levels are kept low. Ideally, there should be no more than one teaspoon of sugar in our blood at any one time. Our bodies therefore produce insulin to move the sugar out of the blood and into our cells to be used as for energy or to be stored as fat. More sugar means more insulin is produced to move the sh sugar quickly before it can cause harm. However, having constantly high levels of insulin causes some of the body's cells to become insulin resistant. These cells refuse to take in any more sugar. The body must then produce even more insulin to force the cells to take the sugar out of the bloodstream. 
to break the cycle of constant sugar spikes leading to constantly high levels of insulin. One can reduce the amount of sugar that is introduced into the body. Your body can make all the sugar that you need to fuel the few cells that absolutely must run on sugar. So, without a constant supply of external supply of sugar, insulin levels are lowered and our bodies can now access stored fat to use as fuel. This also leads to increased insulin sensitivity. These changes can occur in as little as two weeks. One effect of this process is usually weight loss, but improvements to our metabolic health have been shown to occur even in the absence of this. Unfortunately, time does not permit me a more nuanced and exhaustive exploration of this topic, but there are resources available to you in the public health to explore the right dietary prescription for your for the management of your chronic illness and your general wellness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Simpson Smith, for your timely advice. I now hand you over to the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, who will provide us with today's vaccination figures and treat with those current issues relating to the national COVID-19 vaccination campaign. Minister. Thank, thank you very much, Al. Good morning. Good morning to Dr. Paris Ram. And good morning for the first time to Dr. Simpson Smith. Thank you for your very timely advice on how we should eat. I know I follow some of it, but I think I need to follow a little more of it. So thank you for that. I will personally take on board what you have said. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the media and the listening and viewing public. Um, before I get into three main points I want to address this morning, very important points. Let me just bring you up to date on where we are with our vaccination drive. Fully vaccinated, 696,200. Um, Percentage-wise, that reads 49.7%. So we are creeping, not running, not walking. We are creeping towards that magical threshold of 50%. Um, persons who have accessed boosters to date... 117,575 and as we know one of the best ways to protect yourselves against the Omicron variant is to be boosted. So that's the vaccination update. I do want to spend about five minutes alerting the national population of three uh, major issues that we have been dealing with over the past couple of days and some steps we have that we are going to take as the COVID-19 re, uh, response evolves. Um, you would have been noticing that since December 21st, our hospital occupancy rates have been coming down, thankfully. And coming out of that, not only our hospital occupancy rates are coming down, but our step-down rates are coming down, our ICU occupancy rates coming down, HDU rates coming down. Looking at the picture holistically, and if I recall, Dr. Parashram said this morning, there are 29 people at the New Point Fortin Hospital. Um, and, and that has been a pattern at the New Point Fortin Hospital over the past couple of weeks. So in looking at that, uh, we took a decision after consultation with all the stakeholders in the RHAs together with the MP for Point Fortin and the Mayor for Point Fortin, so they are all aware of this, that the Point Fortin Hospital in the short to medium term is going to be decommissioned as a COVID facility and returned to the people, the Burgesses of Point Fortin for their use as a general hospital. This will have significant benefits to Point Fortin so they will no longer have to travel to San Fernando to access primary and secondary care. How is the process going to work? I will briefly go through the decommissioning process. There are currently 28 patients in Point Fortin. As of tomorrow, no new patients will be admitted to Point Fortin. They will be admitted and sent to the other facilities. So that's why we had to have this multi-stakeholder 
agreement first. So they will be sent to other facilities depending on the type of care and level of acuity that they need, whether it's Coover, Arima, Augustus Long, um, St. James, wherever. So as of tomorrow, no new patients will be admitted into Point Fortin. The remainder of the 28 patients, we are not moving them. We don't want to discomfort them. We are not moving them. But what we will do over the next 10 to 14 days, as they recover and they are well enough to either go home or go into a step-down facility, they will be sent to either a step-down facility, depending on the type of care that they need, or go home. We envisage that that process should take between 10 to 14 days. So by week after next, hopefully, if all goes according to plan, we should have no patients left in Point Fortin. Whenever that day reaches that there are no more point, uh, patients left in Point Fortin, the hospital then has to be deep cleaned, thoroughly sanitized, um, restocked with uh, the, the consumables and everything else that they need to run a general hospital. We envisage that deep cleaning, um, that decontamination should take another week. Once that is finished, we leave the facility, as we say in local parlance, to air out for another five to seven days. Um, and during that period, um, the restocking will take place, the repurposing will take place. And then hopefully sometime around the first week in March, the second week in March, I can't give you a firm date because there are so many variables, but we are working with an outside limit of about the middle of March, when all of these processes will be finished, decanting, uh, deep sanitization, airing out that the people of Point Fortin and other surrounding communities, Ikaka, Cedrus, uh, Rosilac, everywhere else, they will now have access to the Point Fortin General Hospital for their primary and secondary health care needs. This is a very important step we are making as our COVID-19 response evolves and as our hospital numbers come down. So that is, that is the main is one of the main issues this morning. Uh, second main issue to address, you may recall at last week's Saturday's press conference, we did indicate we were having talks on Monday, which was yesterday, to secure uh, additional doses of Pfizer vaccines because the doses that we have actually expire at the end of February. And with that in mind, we did not want the Pfizer part of the vaccination program to stop because if you got your first dose on Pfizer in February, then your question is, am I going to get your second dose? So I am happy to report that in the meetings that we had yesterday, uh, we have sourced another 150,000 doses of Pfizer that will come in in two tranches of 75,000 doses each CMO. Um, the first tranche will hopefully um, arrive before the end of February, so we continue our Pfizer, uh, our Pfizer vaccination thrust. Of concern to us with the Pfizer vaccines, and we are working very hard to get these doses. However, the authorities that donate these doses look at us very carefully to make sure we are not wasting doses. The 12 to 18 group, which is that school age population, secondary school age population, that can only use Pfizer at this point in time, 53,423 of those have been fully vaxxed, which is about 59% of that 90,000 estimate for the school population. Now that schools are open, we want to urge parents to bring out your 12 to 18 for another thrust to be vaccinated, especially now that they are out of physical school, which is something we support for all the reasons given 
previously. For adults who still want the Pfizer vaccine, you will get your second dose. We have those doses coming in. Please go out and get vaccinated. Uh, for those who want to partake in carnival activities, you may want to get your Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, so two weeks after getting your first shot, you are considered fully vaccinated. Um, let's, and let's get vaccinated for all these reasons, but also for the main reason to save your life, to make sure our hospital numbers come down. And as those hospital numbers come down, if more and more people get vaccinated, then the next hospital we want to take off the grid as a COVID facility will be Arima. Wouldn't that be a very nice thing for the people of Arima, Aruka, Takarigua, Bonne, all these people um, to finally get back their facility for their primary and secondary health care instead of going to either Sangi Grandi or Eric Williams. So we are taking it one step at a time as we decommission these hospitals. Uh, we hope that this trend continues. Um, I'm also very happy for healthcare workers who are getting a bit of a break. Our accident and emergencies are not as crowded as they were in December and so on. So that's the second issue I wanted to raise. The third issue and final issue is one of very, very deep concern to us at the Ministry of Health and to me personally as Minister, and it should be of deep concern to all parents. You may recall when the COVID response started in 2020, I remember distinctly at the press conferences uh, reminding parents that even though schools are closed, especially primary schools, where you need to show proof of childhood immunization to get into school, don't let the fact that school closures should mean that you don't take your children to be vaccinated. And we urge parents way back then and last year to continue with your childhood immunization program. It is with very deep concern that I now tell the national population, because I asked for the figures, that we have seen a significant drop in the number of children accessing the mumps, measles, and rubella vaccines. We are now down to about 83 and 85 percent, whereas herd immunity the for that same was 90, 95 percent. And this is a global trend around the world where uh, parents are shying away from childhood immunization for a variety of reasons. Um, entry into primary schools has always been the last check and balance and as you know primary schools have been closed but we want to prevent an outbreak of mumps measles and rubella and all other childhood diseases like yellow fever yellow fever we are down to 85 percent um, in managing these numbers we started since last year november reaching out individually to parents because we have the database at the health, health centers to bring in their children to be vaccinated. We started this since last year, I am told, October, November, and it continues. But you are seeing the re-emergence of some childhood diseases post-COVID, which were not there pre-COVID because of the whole issue surrounding vaccines. Um, I just want to express my my fear that these numbers are not good enough and we are appealing to parents of school age children primary school age children who are not vaccinated as they would have been to get into schools even though those primary schools are not as yet open let us rally around our children and make sure we don't expose them to mumps measles rubella yellow fever or polio or any other of the childhood vaccines that we normally give our children freely and without much thinking. So I am appealing to parents this morning, get your children vaccinated for your childhood vaccination 
um, program. So those were the three issues I wanted to raise this morning, Al, and I want to thank you. And um, let's take questions and answers. Thank you very much, Minister. And yes, we move on to our question and answer segment, where we invite members of the media to pose questions to the panel. Media representatives, please state your name and the name of the media house that you represent before posing your questions. We will take two questions per media house during the first round of questions, after which we will field follow-up questions once time permits. Kindly pose one question during all other rounds of questions. Our first question comes from TV6. TV6, good morning. <coughs> Hi, good morning to the entire panel. Alicia Boucher from TV6 here. Um, my question, my first question is for the Minister. Minister, I know health officials were bracing for a surge from the Omicron variant. And given that we, we only entered um, community spread about, let's say, a month ago, I may be wrong, you could correct me. Um, isn't it a bit premature to decommission the Point Fortin Hospital? And would the hospital still be able to take patients who, let's say, are in, um, you know, a serious um, state? I know that the the traditional healthcare system has been taking COVID-19 patients as well. So would it be a similar situation with Point Fortin? That's my first question. Second question I wanted to find out, I, um, in terms, I know that the, the ministry was going to embark on a further education campaign to reach persons on the ground in terms of pushing vaccination, especially as we are attempting to vaccinate the 5 to 11 age group. And I wanted to find out um, where are you with that in terms yeah. of um, in, in terms of strategizing to, to, to sensitize, further sensitize parents and so on in relation to that? And would you be adding mums and so on to that, given that we are having this issue now in terms of um, childhood vaccination? Thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you, Lisa. So both CMO and I will treat, treat with it. So I have a meeting at one o'clock today to do exactly what you have been asking about. That's the rejigging of the campaign. And yes, one of the reasons we didn't launch it as yet is that I was paying attention to these figures. So it's not going to be solely a COVID-19 vaccine campaign. Uh, we want to get back on the ground uh, to resensitize parents about MMR, polio, mumps, and all of that. So I do have a meeting at one o'clock right after this press conference to treat with that. On the issue of Point Fortin, uh, we don't think it's too early. If we thought it was too early, we won't have done it. But in managing risk and benefit, um, we think right now, that's why we are only doing Point Fortin and not Point Fortin and Arima. But the CMO could go into a little more detail there. So, so generally speaking, it's something that we're paying very close attention to on a daily basis. We're looking at the numbers, we're looking at the a &E levels across all of our A&Es for quite a while now, we have seen a reduction in the number of persons presenting. So this morning we had 52 persons who are COVID positive spread across our 10 A&Es across the country, across Trinidad. Um, so we're keeping a very close eye on the A&E numbers in particular. And whoever comes into the emergency department generally, those are the people that will ultimately end up in a hospital or needing hospitalization. You also see the hospital, hospital numbers as I presented this morning going down as well. But as Minister said, the approach is to have no further person, persons admitted to the Point Fortin facility. However, it is not a radical change in the sense that we're trying to decant the facility overnight. Um, if, if, of course, there is a significant change in the number of cases, and again, it's something that we're keeping a very close eye on. So, for example, if there's a significant spike next week, for example, and we see a and is being filled up again, hospital numbers going back, we will have to keep eye on it and reconsider. But we also have, in terms of the plan, scaling up of services, for example, within the Coover facility and other, other facilities to take that um, 60 to 90 bed capacity of Point Fortin and subsume it there with the assistance of various RHAs to lend support with the HR component, which we did in the first part of the pandemic before Point Fortin came on stream. Thank you very much, Minister and CMO. And with that, we go across to Rai Rikumas, 103 FM. Good morning. Hi, good morning, everyone. Rai Rikomas from 103.1 FM. Uh, how many Pfizer shots are still to be used from what's currently in stock in TNT, that being the set that will be expiring at the end of the month? And what level of possibility currently exists of officials not sending some of the 
150,000 newly sourced Pfizer shots given the situation with Pfizer in TNT. Thank you. So as I said, there is a commitment to send the shots. So regardless of what happens to the balance of stock in the meeting that we had yesterday, there is commitment to send 150,000. The balance available, as I indicated at an earlier press conference, is around 286,000 um, doses. Remember, they would have sent to us about 600 plus in two tranches of about 300, roughly. Um, so we have used a significant amount. Um, but remember, Pfizer shots, like AstraZeneca shots, traditionally come with short expiry dates. So those are some of the constraints that we work with. But um, the, the continuing of the receipt of Pfizer shots is independent of the number of doses we are going to have in stock. Um, that was agreed upon in the meeting that we had yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. And we move straight on to azpnews.com. Good morning. Good morning, Friar Bihari, azpnews.com. Um, Minister, just to follow up, um, the, the Pfizer vaccines that we're getting is from the same facility we got the previous ones from America. Um, and, and is there any cost to that? And my second question, the, the seemingly decrease in the vaccinations for, for children who um, has to go into primary school, do you think that is a result of the sort of anti-vax um, movement that we have? For, um, for the COVID-19 vaccine, and if that is the case, is the ministry looking maybe I mean, some educational program to help, you know, more get more of the children who, who have to go in primary school um, their vaccines? Thank you. Thank you. So there is no cost to the Pfizer vaccines. The Pfizer vaccines that we have in Trinidad and Tobago have always been kindly donated by the U.S. government. So there is no cost to the Pfizer vaccines, and we really appreciate um, the role that uh, President Biden and his government, and by extension the people of the United States, has played um, in helping us with our vaccination drive. Um, so there's absolutely no cost for which we are eternally grateful, and we thank the government and people of the United States. On the issue of the, of the childhood vaccinations, prior, even prior to COVID, it was a bit of a struggle, and the CMO could probably be me out here. When I first became Minister of Health back in 2015, and I started to look at childhood vaccination numbers, we were not in a very good place. I think, CMO, we were in the 80s, early 90s, 88, 90, 91, 92%, even prior to COVID. And you are, and you are correct, because there has always been anti-vax sentiment. Uh, we worked very hard in 2016, 17, 18, 19, and we got it up. Um, we got it up to, and I have the figures here, we got it up to 94%, 95%, 96%, which is a good place to be. But since COVID, it has slipped, and I've been telling the population not to let it slip. Um, the the father of the modern anti-vax movement, especially against MMR, is a doctor called Dr. Robert Wakefield out of England, who postulated that MMR vaccines with absolutely no scientific evidence was a precursor to autism. And the anti-vaxxers latched onto that. As a result, vaccination rates for MMR and other childhood diseases dropped in many parts of the world where people are prone to believe in these conspiracy theories and who suffers the babies and children the babies and children so it's a multifaceted issue it's one that we successfully drove between 2016 and 2019 getting it up to 95 96 percent and the current climate doesn't make it easy that's why i have this meeting at one o'clock today because the strategies that we employed then 
uh, before all this talk about vaccines, uh, we may have to learn some lessons and, and, and reimagine the way forward. But I am still appealing to parents act in your baby's and children's best interests as we did prior to COVID when we vaccinated 95, 96, 97% of the children for childhood diseases with not one problem. Not one problem. So prior, I really want to, I really appreciate you asking that particular question to give me an opportunity to explain the position. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Minister. And of course, prior for that question. Uh, we go to Express for your question. Thank you very much. Kim Good morning, Bodram. Kim Bodram from the Express. Uh, Minister, just sticking with the childhood uh, immunization issue. Is it possible to say, you said there was a reemergence of some of these uh, these illnesses, measles, mumps. Is it possible to say where in areas in the country that that is being seen? Because even though children are not in primary school, most of them, it's they may still be socializing in their neighborhoods and in their homes and so on, um, which is also supposed to be kept at a minimum because of COVID. So if that may be of relevance. Also, is there any any statement you can make on a very unfortunate uh, case involving one Mrs. Ms. Catherine Akamlam, uh, who's, uh, who suffered injuries at a hospital after uh, having, um, having been washed with, a, with lye in an area during a procedure. She's been awarded damages by the court, and is there anything you can say about that issue? Thank you. Yeah, so maybe I did not communicate um, properly. The issue of the reemergence of childhood diseases in other parts of the world, I think I said that. However, we have seen no reemergence of mums, measles, rubella in Trinidad and Tobago at this time. At this time. We are just being extra careful. And that's why I used the words this morning, very deep concern about where we are. When you vaccinate children, against childhood diseases, maybe the CMO could talk about this in, as a technical person with 95%, that is herd immunity. So we have no outbreak of mumps, measles and rubella in Trinidad at this time. We are just being ultra careful and I will let the CMO go into that and then I will come back to the other issue. Yeah, so as Minister said, in other parts of the world, there have been resurgence of what we call neglected tropical diseases. So especially in light of the vaccine hesitancy that has been going on surrounding COVID. And even CARICOM has expressed in a recent meeting that there was concern and even PAHO um, of the vaccine hesitancy that has been driven towards COVID spreading towards other childhood diseases. And we're seeing it really happen in a lot of, a lot of the world now. Um, so it is a concern and it's something we have to pay attention to. We build our surveillance systems to, to detect um, new diseases and re-emerging threats so it is something from a surveillance perspective that we, we keep a very close eye on and keep our ears to the ground to ensure that we're looking out for those diseases a lot of them we would have not even seen in our lifetime as practitioners so re-engaging the the training for the physicians on the ground looking for signs and symptoms and of course trying to get that vaccination above 95 percent to protect our population as best as we can in the interim um, but it's really something that we have to pay attention to and be concerned about. Yeah, and one of the things I'm going to do this afternoon after the meeting is reach out to the Pediatric Society um, so we could drive um, the private sector also to work in tandem with the public sector. Right. On the issue of Mrs. Akam, uh, Akam Lam, um, after discussions with the attorney handing the matter for Northwest RHA, I in fact... I, I sought his advice um, if I should reach out because the matter is before the courts. And I did reach out to her last night. I became aware of the issue um, between uh, Sunday and so on. I, I did ask the CEO of the Northwest RHA to send me as much information as possible. Um, that particular incident is very, very distressing to me personally. And I did reach out. Uh, I did reach out to her last night uh, to give her the assurance that, as Minister of Health, once I learned about it this week, I I wish we could turn back the clock, but we can't. 
um, it has disturbed me very, very deeply. And I, I pushed, even though they were already, it was already done and dusted, the Northwest RHA to make all the resources available so that she could leave the country on Saturday. I think that's the schedule uh, date of departure. Uh, the wire transfers um, have been done. I think close to half a million dollars has already been paid out, but that will not compensate her. Um, but it is very, very disturbing. And as a human being, as a son, if that, you know, was my mother, I would, I would be distressed. Um, but in speaking to the lawyers representing Northwest, I can't say much more. But just to say, it's a, it's a very, very regrettable incident. And um, we will do everything possible now to support her in her recovery. Um, that is as much as I can say as authorized by the lawyers. It is before the court, so I have been cautioned not to say too much. But I, yes, I did reach out to her last night after I learned about the incident on Saturday and Sunday. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you very much, Minister. We're ready for a further question with from Newsday. Hi, good morning, Tara Dippens from the Trinidad and Tobago Newsday. Um, just one question for Minister Dial Singh. Um, has there been any progress in the investigation into the circumstances surrounding the arrival of Trinidad and Tobago's first Omicron case? Um, so, as you know, that question was asked several times. It is now a police matter, and any progress on that case um, should be posed to the TTPS. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we go back to TV6 for a follow-up question. Alicia, Hi, Alicia Boucher again. Yes. yes. Hi. Um, my question, Minister, um, we saw reports that the Johnson & Johnson plant, the one that has been, um, you know, approved to make the Johnson & Johnson vaccines has um, closed. And um, according to reports, the COVAX facility and the African um, Union, they were only made aware of that um, via the media. And I was wondering, um, has the Ministry of Health at all um, been speaking with these two platforms concerning that COVAX and the African Union? And um, are there any implications at all for Trinidad and Tobago, given that we've been using the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to reach in particular people in remote, country, um, in, in remote areas and some of the most vulnerable among our population? Thank you. Yeah, so our Johnson & Johnson vaccines came in through the African Medical Supplies platform uh, we have administered, I don't have the exact figure here, but we have had absolutely no problems and we continue to monitor these events, right? So we are always on the ball looking at these events to see what is going on internationally, but we have had no adverse reports on that particular issue. Thank you very much. And with that, we go to ABC News for a follow-up question. Could you, could you unmute, please, Prior? Please unmute. I did. Okay. Are you hearing me now? now? Yes. Yeah. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, Minister, there is a report this morning that a, a clerk at the at the Arima Hospital was held with, with a vaccination card. Um, it has to do, I guess, with the whole issue of security of, you know, fraud in this in this whole um, arrangement of of vaccination cards. Um, is the Ministry aware of this? And, and have you, again, you know, so, sort of implemented more uh, more security measures when it comes to these cards? Yes. Prius, yes, thanks. So you may recall a couple months ago, I was asked a similar question. And it is because a couple months ago, we instituted these new measures, we were able to discover that. So it's an ongoing pro process. And yes, I was quite aware of it because we instituted uh, new measures uh, to curtail that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And we go back to TV6 for another follow-up question. 
Hi, I just had a question, a quick question on natural immunity. Um, if a person develops natural immunity after being infected with a particular strain of the COVID-19 virus, let's say, for instance, Omicron, does the natural immunity that they develop give them protection against other strains as well? Yeah, so, so um, seemingly, I mean, with the Omicron itself, it's a brand new variant of concern. It only came to the world in the end of November in terms of discovery. So it's very new. Um, but certainly there has been cross protection, if you, if you will, um, from being infected with one particular variant and then having some cross protection by way of immunity, naturally acquired immunity, in terms of other types of infection. It varies based on the variant of concern. Um, it varies based on the individual's health in terms of their comorbidity status and whether they are on any kind of medication. But there is some sort of cross protection that has been shown in the literature um, when you're infected with one particular strain and you have a, another variant of concern coming after. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I just want to go back to the question that Alicia asked about the Johnson & Johnson facility. I'm just reading a, a report here. Apparently the plant was shut down, or oh, not shut down, stopped making JNJ vaccines so they could focus on making other vaccines which are more profitable. That's that's what a report is stating, that they switch to making other vaccines which are more profitable to them. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for that clarification. And prior, I realize that you have a, a follow-up question. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you again. Good morning. Um, this question, I'm ready for the CMO. CMO, um, I want to find out about the, your third uh, primary dose and the booster shot. Someone is asking, if they get the they get their their third primary dose, are they then yeah, I'm eligible to to get a booster shot and then and and if so when? Certainly. After so the, so the, the point of a third when we started to describe an additional primary dose, it was in popu it, persons in particular, for example, those who would have had Sinopharm over sixty, and those who were immunocompromised were offered an additional dose, right? Um, those doses are called part of your primary series because it means that it, it, it completes your vaccination series. In theory, those persons will then be eligible to have a booster um, in the normal time frame as an, a booster is offered for any other category. So you complete your primary, so we're not counting numbers now. So for example, for Johnson & Johnson, a um, person who, who required two to have a primary completion will now need three. And then of course, Sinopharm, you would, you would have three primaries and then you'll have a booster. But follow the same time frame as we had spelled out before for all the boosters. Thank you very much. See you more. Alicia, I realize that you have some more questions. We're ready to yes, um, respond. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Yes, Minister, you are correct. Um, they started making uh, different vaccines, right? Not COVID-19 vaccines. Um, do we, but that's the, the, based on the report, it's the plan that is approved to make the J&J &J vaccines. So do we have, sh should we be concerned at all? Um, are we reach, are we planning to reach out to the African Union, the COVAX facility, um, in, in terms of our future supply or, and, and so on? Should we be concerned about that? Okay, so I will tell you why we should, sorry. So I will tell you why we should not be totally concerned. The Johnson & Johnson stock that we have in hand right now is 204,432 with an expiry date of May to June 2023. So right now we have more stock than we need with a good expiry date. And, um, and I always urge people when we read the reports um, because the way the question was could have been misinterpreted that the plant may have been shut down for quality control reasons or so on. So the vaccine, and, and this is what feeds the hysteria about vaccines. So the plant was, the plant took a decision to switch to making other profitable vaccines, had nothing to do with plant integrity, vaccine integrity. It, had, it was a commercial decision. And our stock is 204,432, expiring between May and June of next year. So there's no need for us now 
to reach out to any of the platforms to get more Johnson & Johnson vaccines at this point in time or for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Minister. We will take a follow-up question from The Express. Morning again. Kim Bodram from Express again. Minister, this is something that was recently ventilated, and if not yourself, the Ministry would have said that, no, there is no shortage of drugs in the public system for people who are, you know, in the, in the clinic databases. But maybe another cycle has come and gone. We are still getting many, many reports of people who are uh, outpatients saying that when they go for, to the dispensaries, they're not getting a lot of their drugs. But And also, also because of COVID-19, and, and you would have mentioned the decommissioning and the returning uh, to the people of the Point Forting Hospital. So in some areas where people are on a rotation, they don't always see a doctor. They go and they are given their renewed prescriptions or they may go to the dispensary for their drugs. So they, f they are feeling a bit dis dis disconnected, I'm sorry, um, from the system when they can't get their drugs after a few cycles and they feel as if they don't know what's happening. It's a sense of confusion in the public. If you could address that again. Thank you. Thank you. So I was very careful and I remember my words carefully. I never said there was no shortage of drugs. I said there was no chronic long-lasting shortage of drugs at this particular point in time. The world has been wrapped by COVID-19. Supply chains have been totally disrupted. And those were my, well, those were my words. There was no chronic long-lasting supply, um, supply interruption. Um, the issue of patients feeling disconnected is one that we have addressed here numerous times. And that is why we are taking these steps now to return the public health system to a state of normalcy with the point four ten decommissioners of COVID facility. You would recall that I said clearly that if people don't get vaccinated, we will have no choice but to shut down outpatient services, which is exactly what you are speaking about because we have to deploy resources, especially human resource, to manage people in the public health system, 85% of whom are unvaccinated. And, and that's the conundrum that we face, and healthcare systems around the world have been facing this, as they divert resources against treating people for non-COVID reasons, a broken leg in a hospital in the United States, a heart attack, and we continually plead with the population, do your part, get vaccinated. And I remember using the phrase, I want granny and grandpa to get their cataract surgery. But if I have to be continually deploying resources and taking resources away from these vital services that people depend on to treat mainly the unvaccinated, we will have these problems. So, as we move forward in this phase of the COVID response, even months ago, we never totally shut down elective surgeries. What we did was that we prioritized elective surgeries. We prioritized um, some outpatient clinics. But you are right, Kim, there is going to be that disconnect because telemedicine can take you so far and no further. We want to return to the normal state of affairs where people have that physical, personal interaction with their doctors to manage their chronic diseases, as Dr. Simpson Smith said here this morning. And I am hoping that with the decommissioning of Point Fortin, it starts a trend that will snowball where then I could decommission Arima, take the staff that was treating COVID patients back into the outpatient clinics so that those patients could get their one-on-one -on -one care, right? So let's all work together with this. And one of the ways to do that is for that other 50% of the population, please, please, please get vaccinated. It will help because right now, we are down to about 400 to 500 people a day being vaccinated, just not good enough. Okay, so thank you, Kim, for raising that issue. Thanks, Thanks again, Kim. And would that we go back to AZP News for a follow-up question? 
Yes, thanks again. Uh, uh, Minister, all right, I do want to follow up on a question I had asked about, you know, the, the stock of vaccines we have, you know, a, a, if you give us the figures per brand. Thank you. Yes, so I gave the Johnson Johnson figure, I gave the Pfizer figure, uh, Sinopharm, we have... Yes, press the button. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, you would think after two years doing this, I will press the button. Sinopharm, 278,000 available. Pfizer, which I said earlier, 286,498. And Johnson and Johnson, 204,432, which means we have 768,930 vaccines um, shots in hand in the country right now. Thank you very much, Minister. And with that, we go back to TV6 for a follow up question. Alicia? Thank you so much, Minister. Yes. Hi, Minister. I just wanted some clarity on Point 14. Is it that the accident and emergency at Point 14 um, would still be taking COVID-19 patients as they come in and um, awaiting transfer, should that situation arise, awaiting transfer into the other COVID-19 um, health facilities, the ones that are designated for COVID-19? Thank you. So, so generally speaking, what, what would happen is the San Fernando General Hospital is the one that would take the COVID patients in and then they will be transferred to the relevant facility. For example, Augustus Long, once a diagnosis of COVID has been made and, we, and they have determined that the person requires some level of hospitalization, they can either go to a hospital level care, ICU, or a step down as they see fit. But that, that intake will be through the San Fernando General Hospital um, or any of the other peripheral ANEs, the, the smaller ANEs, for example, the Coover District Health Facility. Thank you very much, CMO. And that's all the time we have for questions today. And as we close off today's media conference, we want to thank the media presenters and you, our listening and viewing public, for your presence today. And we want to say goodbye and please stay safe. I'm from Borneo Gardens, Aruka, and I am fully vaccinated. I chose to get vaccinated because I suffer from asthma and I was really concerned about my health during the pandemic. I encourage others to get vaccinated because your health is important and you should do what you need to do to preserve your life. Don't delay. Get vaccinated today. A message from the Ministry of Health. Good day, guys. My name is Carlos Hunt, born and raised in Santa Cruz. I recently got the Pfizer booster to help in the fight against COVID-19 infection. I took it to the main cause of not being hospitalized severely or for like two years. I implore all of you watching this video to get vaccinated. If you are vaccinated, get the booster. We all want to protect our loved ones and protect our close friends and family. Don't delay. Get vaccinated today. A message from the Ministry of Health.